Okay, I'm Pete Herzog. I work for a group called ISACOM. Well, it depends where you are. Some people call it ISACOM. Uh, we're a nonprofit research organization around since 2001. We do security stuff, um, mainly research. Uh, so first, I want to shout out thanks to 44Con for having me here. It's been a long time coming. Uh, haven't always been able to make it work out, uh, but I'm, I'm happy in the end that I'm, actually I'm really happy that I'm here. Uh, I think they did a great job. I've been to quite a few of these types of conferences. These types meaning technical, lots of geeks, uh, my kind of people. Uh, not, not so much the, the, the sales and marketing, InfoSec Europe, RSA kind of thing. Not really my jam. So I really like this. I like how it's working out, and I hope you guys do too. Okay, my talk today, let's begin. Okay, just to get warmed up and started, I have a place for this. <clears throat> I want you guys to think for a moment, if you could have anything in the world, anything that you want, anything, you get one wish, I want you to think about it for a second. Uh, count of three, I want you all to say it out loud at the same time. Okay, so take a second, think. What's that one thing you could have anything else in the world? Anything. Okay, ready? One, two, three. Better cybersecurity, right? Yeah, that's, that's what we're here for. I heard it, I, I heard. Some of you said information security. Um, I said cybersecurity. Yeah, I did. And you know what, I like it. I do. I like it. You know why? because I used to have to say, oh, what do you do? Oh, I do network security and hardware security and information security, and, and now I just say cybersecurity, and it's everything all at once. And, and everybody says, oh, I hate the cyber word, I hate it. But you know what I hate more? Having to explain to people what I do using all those other words. So now I just say cybersecurity, and they picture me as that guy on TV who's crawling through air ducts, and that's okay, yeah? So you guys all said better cybersecurity. I, maybe, maybe that one lady back there didn't, but she, I think she was just daydreaming. Um, that's what we all want, and what we're gonna talk about today is why you can't have it, okay? So, moving on. Let me tell you a little story. Oh, look at that, Cup of Joe. It's the best conference. See, it's getting better all the time, thank you. <clears throat> Let me tell you a little story. Maybe you've heard this before. Uh, story called the frog and the scorpion. So basically the scorpion, he wants to get across the river, but he can't, because you know, scorpions don't swim so good. So anyways, scorpion can't get across the river, so he puts an ad out, he says he wants to hire a frog to get him across the river. Frog shows up all eager, hey man, I can get you across the river. Scorpion climbs on his back, stabs him, kills him, before they even get to the river. So the scorpion's like, fine, I need another frog who can get me across the river. Three more sh frogs show up, all of them, one resume better than the next, all of them very eager to get that scorpion across the river, and each one, one at a time. But before, before the scorpion's even ankle deep in the river, all three frogs are dead. More frogs show up, all of them. Oh, I'll take you across the river, I can do it, those guys sucked, I can get you across the river better. Scorpion grabs on them, rides, sting, 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 all dead. Eventually, last one dead, no more frogs show up. Scorpion sinks into the water, dies. Now, if this was an MBA program and not a security conference, you'd be sitting there thinking, those frogs sucked. They didn't do their jobs. You know, they had one job, one job, get the scorpion across the river, and they couldn't do that. They failed at their job. But you, you're security people. And you're sitting there and you're thinking, holy crap, they're all scorpions. And that's really who we work for. We work for scorpions. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. How do you survive that? How do you, how do you live in a world and work in a world where they're all scorpions? Well, I don't think it's news to any of you that cybersecurity professionals are mostly an unhappy bunch. On a, on a sadder note, we, we have a, a huge rate of depression, actual clinical depression in our field. For those who aren't clinically depressed, we have stress fat, 
we have overeating, we have uh, drinking, we have uh, yeah, basic relationship problems and probably getting fired, right? That's, that's, that's pretty much what we can look forward to, yeah? So we, we have good reason for not, being, uh, uh, for, for, not, for not being happy. And the thing is, is that it's happening to all of you. So if any of you actually thought you were unique and you were happy about that, well, you're not. So continue being miserable, okay? So basically, we all got into cybersecurity because we love it. We can't think of doing anything else. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not crapping on cybersecurity here. I love it. I couldn't do anything else. And I have to tell you, if you got into cybersecurity mainly because you like hanging out with middle-aged white guys with big egos and, and like to humble brag a lot, then you're in for a treat. But you don't deserve one, though. Okay? Basically, if cybersecurity were an animal, it would be a raccoon guarding the garbage can that it eats out of while washing its hands, its little tiny hands in the stream, thinking it's dignified. Okay? That's where we're at. How many of you are hating me now? You know who's hating me? The ones who haven't done this long enough. That's what I think. Um, I'm just trying to make a little humor here. Okay? The thing is, is that our big thing is that Cybersecurity needs to learn the language of business. How many people have heard that? If we can't talk business, we're screwed, right? Every book, every cybersecurity book, or information security book, wherever you get blog posts, they're all telling you, learn the language of business, learn how to talk about risk, risk with the big R, risk with the little R, learn how to calculate it, tell us the money, show us how much we need, how much effort, man hours, you know, start, go get your MBA degree, talk to us like business, you know? Uh, but really, they need us too, okay? <laughs> business needs it. And nobody's going out and telling them. I haven't seen any business blogs going, oh, you should learn the language of cybersecurity. That's not happening. I, I taught an MBA program, and, and they called it uh, business information security, and it was one of the least popular electives, which is why I'm not doing it anymore. But... <laughs> The truth is, is that, yeah, nobody's telling them that they need to learn cybersecurity, which is strange because they're all teaching them about accounting fraud and all, all, all sorts of bad things, yeah? So, so that security is definitely on the plate for them, just not cybersecurity. So, I mean, there's definitely a codependency here, but they're kind of doing their own thing and, and we're kind of being abused. The thing is, is that companies are not going to change. Since the 70s, Look at environment, right? So we, we've had all sorts of, business knows that they can abuse things to make money, you know? So since the 70s, we, we've seen this with uh, Environmental Protection Acts. Um, you know, we see fracking, reactor cooling, uh, basically energy production, any place where they can trash the environment, they do. Uh, thankfully in the 90s, it, no, it hasn't stopped. Yeah, it's still going, they're still losing getting fined occasionally, and yeah, the environment's still crap. So don't think that inf information security or cybersecurity since, what, since the 90s, thousands, 2000s, since we, I mean, if environment hasn't improved through business, and business, you can't tell me in the last 50 years business hasn't learned that trashing the environment's not necessarily good for the environment, it is good for business, apparently, um, that they're going to learn this same thing with cybersecurity just because we go and we tell them, oh, you need cybersecurity or you're going to lose money or you're going to lose people's identities. That's not going to happen, yeah? Companies are not going to change. And we have proof. We've seen it. We've seen all sorts of things that they haven't changed. Well, that was a pretty downer for this morning, huh? I bet you're glad you came here now. The thing is, the truth, and I'm sorry that I have to tell you the truth, it's not a Disney movie. Okay, you're, you're, you're not just a bunch of rascally kids who are going to give the comeuppance to the board. You know, you're not going to, you're not going to show them the way and, and they all get there and what's coming to them, go to jail and the company fails and the CEO steps in dog shit on the way home. You know, it's, it's not a Disney movie. Nothing's going to happen. At worst, they'll take a little hit. The security guy will get fired. Okay. <laughs> And then in, within a year, stock price will be right back with projected earnings. Yeah, it sucks. It sucks. Okay. 
So keep in mind, cybersecurity is a cost center with a lost motive and no profit incentive. Yet, business needs it. They do, or they would lose what they have. So let's, let's take a moment here. I mean, we, we all read the blogs. We, we all see what's going on. We go to a lot of talks. Let's not fool ourselves. Let's look at ourselves for what we are. Okay, That is who we are. There's, there's nothing but truth to that. And the thing is, is that the sooner you embrace the truth, the sooner you see your place in it. And again, I personally couldn't do anything else and be happy. Okay? But a long time ago, I've, I've stopped with the illusion that we can change and, and that we can make everything better and we can all get along. Instead, I just realized it's a codependent relationship and I use them as much as they use me. And that's what I'm trying to talk to you about. How do you make life better for yourself? Okay? We need each other. They just don't know that yet. Yeah? So, the whole idea here is that we recognize this codependence the way it is. Okay? We know that they're going to keep coming out with dumber and dumber things where they're going to make money, and they're going to expect us to secure it. And that's fine. That's fine if you go into it with the attitude that you're going to use them, that they need you. Okay? It's, it's not fine if you go in there like all those happy frogs. And believe me, those frogs, they were enthusiastic. They're like, yeah, I'm going to do this job and I'm going to do it good. I'm going to be the best scorpion carrier there ever was. They go in there with best intentions and, and that's... That's how we do it. I mean, we like doing this. So, we do need each other, yeah? The thing is, is that if we go out there and we try to sell ourselves as we're a way to increase profits, customers, keep our stock price stable, if we go out there and we sell that and we push that, we're lying to ourselves. We are a cost center, okay? Those things, yes, can we do it? To some degree, probably, for, for some markets, some places, you know. But there's easier ways for business to do that than spending money on security. So don't think your way is the way that makes them the most money. It's not. They lose more money doing security than, than by actually, you know, implementing it. And they know that. They know that there's easier ways, you know. I mean, the thing is, is that while in this codependent relationship, we're out there and we're, we're saying to cybersecurity, we're, we're, we're trying to sex ourselves up. And we're like, hey, look at us. Look at us. We get your stock price up. Look how pretty we are. Look what we can do for you. And we really try to sell ourselves to them, you know? And, and it's, it's not working because they're out there sowing their oats and, and making their money and doing whatever and ignoring us. And we're trying harder and harder. And so what do we do? We turn to compliance. We turn to the government. You know, it's like, it's, like, it's like turning to your spouse's parents for help on getting their attention, you know? We go to the government and we say, hey, uh, make them follow compliance. Make them do this. And then they'll have to pay attention to us. We, we naively actually believe that, you know? We say, yeah, think of the children, their privacy. We need better privacy laws. Ha, we got GDPR. Look what happened, you know? Screw you guys. We have a bunch of people who don't know anything about privacy now tell you about privacy. And this is, this is the problem. So now you, you have this big document that conflicts itself and contradicts itself, and we have to make that happen until we get fired for it, right? So, <laughs> such a fun talk. Uh, <laughs> think of the children, yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> We are desperate. We're desperate to get businesses' attention. And honestly, we're not going to get it. Some of you, maybe you're lucky you work for a company where you're going to get it. Some of you are in consulting and you see it all the time that it's not really going to happen. You know, I, I, I do envy the lucky those of you who are in a place where, where the company does care. And they do value you, and they do listen to you, and it happens. I've run into them. Usually they've been breached. 
okay? But they, they care then, right? <laughs> but, but it is desperation on our part, you know? So let's take a look at this. The thing is, is that, okay, as, as, a, as an MIT trained mathematician that I cosplay, I like to look at the numbers, okay? And I look at the numbers and I say, look at this. Success is when the numbers go down. Time's caught cheating on your spouse, bones broken for gambling debts, you know, episodes of Kardashians you watch. As those numbers go down, you can consider that success, yeah? Well, it's similar in security, okay? Now, allow me to be, you know, the crowbar of statistics that hits you in the head, but security control utilization's gone down from 2017 to 2018, by the way, from 40 to 30 percent. Average number of security products has gone from four to five. Average number of SecOps team members has gone from three to two. Our effectiveness has gone down. So you guys have probably heard there's two million open cybersecurity jobs or 1.25 or 3.8 or whatever the number happens to be. There's a lot of security jobs out there. Most of them aren't called cybersecurity. Most of them are just IT that needs some security, okay? And the thing is, is that part of the problem is we're, we're, we're facing this thing where we have really good tools. Tools are getting better. That's for sure. There's no doubt about that. Tools are getting better, but our effectiveness in using them is going down. So even though more and more tools are being bought, more and more tools are going out there, there's less people to configure them properly, less people who, who can actually work with them right. Uh, it's, it's a downward trend. It's not looking good for us, yeah? So what ends up happening? we put in more effort. Those of us who are there, who are in the ditches, are putting in more effort. So technically, you can say that cybersecurity, if we could go out there to the public and make a you know, public service announcement, we would tell them that their cybersecurity is built on human suffering. So maybe Nike will employ us. How do we move forward? Well, see, this isn't all down. I've been working in this field too, pretty long, and I've come to this realization a long time ago, and so I started working with it and trying to figure out how we can move ahead. How can we do better? How can I not be like those eager frogs who gets stung? And the thing is, is that I don't think there's any way you can actually avoid being stung, you know? Um, lucky those of you who have never been fired or lost a job or downsized in security. You know, I've had my share of it. And the thing is, you have to keep bouncing back because, well, you know, you need a job, but also because you kind of love it. You wouldn't be at a conference like this if you didn't actually really like security. Yeah? So let's talk about how you can fix that. All right. The main technique that I've learned on how to address security and I'm not going to talk about the politics. I'm not going to talk about, I'm talking about doing your job. Because once the politics is all over, once all that, that stuff that happens in the boardroom, doesn't matter how much you try to fight this mathematically or, or talk like business, you're all in the same place. Because businesses out there, they're going to find the next hot thing to screw up and try to make money on and dump it on you. Okay? So this is what's always worked for me. And, uh, and, you know, I do run a research organization, so it's not like I just pulled it out of somewhere. I, this is something we've actually studied and worked on. So, first thing, I, first thing I do when I walk into a place and I know that I have to make sure that there's security, well, let me take a little step back. First thing I don't want to have to do is put out fires all day. Who loves that? Who loves running around, putting out fires, somebody's computer's making some noise, I want to go check it out. Who, who loves answering the phones, explaining to people that they have to reboot? Nope. Why did you get in this job then? Okay. There's always the one, you know, I, me, but there was nobody here. Weird. Okay. So, <laughs> I don't like doing that. So the first thing I like to do is try to take control of what I have. Yeah? 
My job is to do security. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do my job in a good way that also covers my ass at the same time. I will probably still get fired, but at least I won't lose your respect, which means I'll find another job pretty quickly because there's like two million of them open, right? So <laughs> it's, it's like 7-Eleven workers, you know? If I know how to use this slushy machine, man, there's always another 7-Eleven across the street, so. Anyways, so the whole point here is I go in, and the first thing I try to do is I separate. Okay? Now, a lot of people like to go in, they say, oh, we're going to patch all the machines, and then we're going to look for all the vulnerabilities, we're going to scan for that. No, no, no. You're going to be chasing fires. You start doing that. You want to minimize the amount of mess you have to deal with. So you start separating. Okay? You want to separate the assets from the threats, physically if possible. You want to shut down ports, shut down services, get rid of systems you don't need. You want to streamline yeah, you want to make sure that you have physical, logical separations between the assets and a threat. So what I look for is interactions. Where can they actually interact with each other? That's the first thing I do. And I might tell the engineers, hey, give me some maps. I want to see some network diagrams. I want to, you know. And the more complicated it is, the more of them I have to get involved. And I say, hey, OK, let's go to the whiteboard, and we draw it out. You know, I do the Columbo thing because there's no way we can know all the technologies, yet they assume that we can secure all the technologies without realizing the fact that if you don't know how it works, you can't actually really secure it. And even worse, if you don't know how it all works together, including the people in it, you're not going to be able to, to secure it. Uh, I'll throw a little golden nugget out there for you. Every person involved interacting within a process, you can count as one vulnerability. So the more people you can reduce out of it, out of your processes, the less vulnerabilities you're going to have. It's true. People are a mess, yeah? They're chaotic, they do whatever they want, you can give them whatever training you want, they get tired and cranky and they'll screw up anyways, okay? So I, I do as much separation as I can, and I go further. I separate my security from my assets. You don't want your security sharing resources with your assets, because when your security goes down or your security has a hard time, your assets can't deliver either. I like to tell people it's kind of like uh, if you're defending a town, you don't move all your soldiers in that town to displace the people that are there and eat their food and drink their water and make them also targets. That's part of the problem. I mean, you saw that with Heartbleed. With Heartbleed, you had that problem where you had a, uh, something secure, like SSL, that became the vulnerability, which took the memory from the server that was sharing and shared that out. Where that didn't happen is where you had SSL termination before the server, because there was nothing in memory to share. And what did you do? You separated the security from the asset. So that's what I do. It's a good hint, it's a good place to start. You do your separations. Then, once you're separated out, and you have things compartmentalized, and you have a good idea, you want to clean the environment, and you want to own it, OK? So I'll go through. I'll, I'll check Wireshark. I'll be watching TCP dump. I'm going to try to minimize the amount of noise that's in there. I want to start cleaning it up. I want to get rid of services we don't need. I want to do real hardening, you know, by actually least privileged stuff and not just installing more software. I want to reduce software, yeah, that, that doesn't need to be. And, uh, and it's amazing how far you can go with that. I mean, there's, there's places where we don't even run antivirus because you just don't need it. It just adds attack vector. And the places sometimes we have to put it back in because compliance says. Compliance says, yeah, you need this product, so go increase your attack vectors so that you can be more secure. It's compliance for you. Um, it's, all, it's all written by us, though, so it's our own fault. Uh, next thing, you want to control the interactions. Wherever you have interactions coming in, because you have operations, you need to serve web pages, you need to do mail, you need to have DNS, all this kind of stuff, you want to take control. You want to start putting controls on there, authentication, encryption, uh, integrity checks. I mean, there's, there's 10 controls. Use them wisely. Use them broadly. You put them out there. 
and you start controlling things. So really in that order, separate, clean, own your environment. Sorry, I didn't say much about owning it. One of the things I hate is default installs because when you do default installs, it has default logins, default. Why? Why make it so easy for, for someone? Make it, make it home field advantage. Install it the way you want to. Do what you need to do so that you have, so, so that the attacker has a little bit harder to understand what you're doing. I like to think of that as privacy as a control. Yeah. So then when all of those three things are done, then I start dealing with vulnerabilities, not before. Why? Because I'm going to have a whole lot less of them to worry about. I'm going to have a whole lot less to worry about patching and hurrying and racing the, the, the criminals to patch. OK? Why? Because there's less for them to get to, less interactions. Less interactions, less attack surface. Less attack surface, less putting out fires. Me, more happy, seeing more movies, getting home on time. Yeah? So when I get fired, at least I can be like, oh, they paid me pretty good, and you know, I had a good run with Netflix. You know? So I mean, at least I enjoyed what I did. And that's the thing. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the whole security part of it. I, I enjoyed going through Wireshark and looking for things. I enjoyed the incident response when I had to, and actually then investigating and looking. I enjoyed what I got into this for. You know, not talking to Susan from accounting about why her hard drive is making that light. That's not why I got into it. You know? I mean, that was IT support. That was way back when I was younger, before there was IT security. And, and I'm still doing it. So I didn't have to. I fixed that part of it, and I started addressing things. I like to think of them as cybersecurity analgesics. Yeah? I just make things nicer, feeling better for me while actually securing and fixing what needs to be fixed. Let me give you a little hint. This is a thing called a four-point process. Um, one of the things that we figured out was that there's actually only four ways that there could be any kind of interactions. So I didn't have to go nuts. Once we figured out there was only four ways, we knew that there was uh, you could interact directly, there was emanations coming off of a target, uh, there was the environment that you could establish facts from, things that you could see in the environment. And then, of course, you could change resources in the environment to affect the target as well. And those were the four things that I had to look at. So anything that I had to secure, they give me a new technology, they say, hey, we're going to do this IoT thing, or, or we're going smart city, or whatever it is they throw at me. I say, OK, I don't know it. I sit down with the engineers, and I start plugging it in here. OK. What are the emanations there? What, what's what's going to give off on this? You know, and I start going through these, one at a time. What kind of environment does it sit in? This tool here has saved my ass. I don't know how many times because I discover things that everybody else forgot. And what that ends up doing for me is giving me peace of mind. I don't want to have to put out fires. I don't want to have to do continuous maintenance. That doesn't scale. If you have to put people on it to check something and look at something, that's not going to scale. So this is something you need to do. We call something called the, we call this the trifecta. And this is another thing I apply. I look at these three things. How do current operations work? How do they work differently from how management or the engineers think they work? And then how do they need to work? And I actually draw this out. I take these and I start. I do number one. I draw it out. Then I go to number two. And this is kind of how it looks like on a whiteboard. This is something I did actually two weeks ago. So I start with how it is now and how we're going to get there. So on the left-hand side, I have all the controls. There's uh, 10 controls listed at the top. I look at the network, the server, the application. And I do this for each, for, for each one that they throw at me, each, each new implementation, yeah? And I, and I look at it as a whole. And every X you see, and this is, this is a real thing I just did, every X you see was where they had no controls. They had no security. And this was a live, real business, yeah? It was, and so when I see this, and they, they, they actually hired, they wanted a penetration test, and I saw this and I said, are you kidding me? Because I hate writing reports. And if you, if you have to test something that has no security, you're, you're looking at like a 500-page report, right? So I might as well just build the damn thing for you. Yeah? 
So instead, I show them this. You take this to management and be like, see where the X's are? That's where you have no security. That's why I'm not going to test you. Let's fix this first. Yeah? And then I go and I take the red marker, sometimes a Sharpie just to screw with them, and I start putting in ideas of what we could do to improve it. And I show them with them there and their engineers there, and I start putting it out. And what does that do to business? that shows progress, that shows something that's going to happen. It shows them value, OK? It actually makes them interested, because now they get to spend money. Yeah? In the end, I do write a report. And that report looks like this. I take the same thing. I make it pretty. Yeah? And I actually start putting in possible solutions, things that they could do, things that they could fix. This is actually from a smart city implementation we just did in California. Um, of street lighting, like like uh, so, I, I was working with a company called Crypto Move, who was who was putting in uh, security for for street lamps and the smart city implementation. Um, but yeah, this is this is how I do it, and then we deliver this, and they have a good idea of what we're actually trying to do. And you know what else it does? It covers my ass. So should something go wrong, I could be like, yeah, look, <laughs> I said it. I said you're missing these controls. I'll get fired anyways. But but at least I have this, and I have your respect, which means a lot to me. Um, another thing I do, we have this vendor checklist we came up with, which kind of does the same thing. You can actually find this online uh, as a web app. Uh, we're coming out with iPhone and Android app as well for it. I think we're, it's called Security Tuna. Um, and basically, what you do is you go through, it's 25 questions. You answer questions like, does the vendor have a process for assuring the identity of who they are dealing with for administrative billing and support services? All yes or no. You go through, you do that with the client, you do it by yourself. It gives you actual security score, what their attack surface probably is. Uh, we've done many tests with this. From an actual real test where we've done the security test versus filling out the questionnaire, we come within 10% accuracy which is not bad for a freaking yes or no questionnaire. Um, so it's definitely worth using, especially against vendors that you can't test or people you can't test. When I get vendors in who try to sell something and a company asks me to sit in and listen to them, I'll pull out the questionnaire, ask them questions about it. It also does a trust analysis. We have another, another 25 questions which will tell us how trustworthy they are or if they're bullshitting us. Uh, all free online. You can just grab it. Helps a lot. And it talks to business in a way that they understand. Yeah? Finally, we have a, a thing called the STAR. Uh, we're, uh, sorry, these are attack surface metrics. I can actually count them up using the, the OSTEM. Uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the Open Source Security Testing Methodology Manual. Uh, if you don't know it, you probably aren't in security that long, because it's been around since 2001. Um, and you can actually measure an attack surface. It's, it's a little complicated. There's a lot of universities written theses on it and stuff on the math. But once you get to know it and you use it, you can be like, holy crap, man, you have a 14% attack surface here. Which means it doesn't mean it's not risk. It doesn't mean you're going to get attacked. But it means if somebody wants to attack you, they're going to figure it out. you got to look at it this way. If making, this is always the question, does making something harder to do make it more secure? So if you think about it, like encryption and things like that, does making something harder to do make it more secure? Or does it just shrink the amount of people who can actually do it to you? That's a huge difference. You know, That's by saying, oh, we don't put bars on our second story windows because you know, who can get there except people who can climb? So let's just hope they don't show up, <laughs> you know? And then we're secure. And it's the same idea. So we say, well, it looks like 14% uh, attack surface. So, you know, as long as those 14% don't show up, you're probably doing great, you know? So <laughs> let's hope. So if security is a process, let's just call it uh, security is getting lucky. Yeah, there's our catchphrase. Security is getting lucky. There, we can go with that. Um, finally, we have the STAR, which is the Security Test Audit Report, which you definitely should look into. Uh, really, the great thing about this is it totally covers your ass, because you only see the front page here. There's seven pages, 
And the rest of it is yes or no questions where you go through, it tells you the things that you've done in your test and analysis, yes or no, and it gives you a place where you explain why you didn't do it. Customer said was out of scope. Customer said no. And then you sign it and they sign it and they accept it. And then that way when they're breached, because they will be because they didn't fix anything you said, then you can be like, no, no, it's here. You said don't test this. And actually, it's uh, for, for one company I know for a fact, they went to court over this. And the star actually saved their asses because the company signed off on it. Because the company did not fix. They did get breached. It happened. Yeah? So this is definitely something you want to look into. It will help you work with business. Plus, it's a, it's a nice sheet. And it gives them a score. They love their scores. Yeah? So we actually do a lot of these. This one score says 91.3, which is actually pretty high. Um, typical bank will run about 87. It's based on 100 being their perfect balance of security. And uh, so, I mean, you, you can have, uh, you can do any size, any, I mean, it's completely scalable, but it's really, really handy to have to, to give with a report. And I like to think of them as, uh, as, as security test crack. So, like, I'll give the first one for free, you know, to the customer. And then, and then they'll always come back because they'll always look for it because they're like, where's my score to all the other people? And they're like, no, no, here, you have this yellow light on the traffic symbol. And, and then they're like, no, no, I want the number. So this is, I'm telling you, you want a security crack. Again, you'll get fired, right? But, but there's always more crack addicts out there, yeah? OK, so in conclusion, right, they're all scorpions. You can do a better job protecting yourself and you know not hating security so much. Um, so thank you and thank 44Con. Woo.